Good morning, Chapel family. If you're new here, my name is Ryan, and I'm your pastor. I'm glad you are here this morning. Man, it has been a wild week, week and a half for me. Um, so indulge me with a quick story. This week, uh, I was sitting in my office at my desk. I was working on my sermon and Bible studies, and I get a call from my wife who was out at the bus stop waiting to get my son from the bus. Now, between the two of us, I will say that I am more prone to sad tears, and my wife is more prone to hysteric tears. Um, and she says, Jackson did not get off the bus. Now, for a backstory, I am hyper-protective of my kid because of my past and things that I had gone through. Uh, I did, it took me uh, until Jackson was six years old before I let non-family members watch him. And I was like, there's only girls that can watch him and only in public spaces with security cameras. So the bus was a big deal for me. And I was like, I'm going to trust the school system. They're not going to let me down. And then all of a sudden that call comes. And Amy goes, he is not on the bus. So I call the school, and I'm in dad mode. Hello, my son is not on the bus. He did not get off the bus. Where is my son? And then all of a sudden, they say, well, what is your son's name? Jackson Tyrona. What bus is he on? 5017, purple bus, first grade, Miss Pentati's class. I'll just wait. That's all good. And then... They say, can you hold, please? Now, you don't tell a parent that's freaking out about their kid to hold on the phone. So Amy's at the bus stop. I have one kid sleeping over here. She's got the other kid over there. So I hop in the car. I abandon a sleeping baby in my house. I go past the bus stop. I'm saying, babe, I'm going to the school. I'm on hold. I show up in the office in my basketball shorts and probably what looks like um, just like my undershirt. I'm like, where is my child? Who am I on hold with? I point at a lady on the phone. Am I on hold with you? And she goes, Ryan Tyrona, yes, that's me. Where's my son? We don't know. The principal's already there. My son's teacher's already there. The principal says, Miss Pentati, take him into the conference room. And I'm like, uh uh, no. You teach my kid words, you don't take me to the conference room. Mr. Tyrona, we are so sorry. We don't know where your son is. The bus drivers are supposed to answer their phone, but your son's driver is not answering her phone. So I go from DEF CON. Five, two, I'm going to kill somebody. But I love Jesus, so I'm like, okay, let's not kill anybody just yet. So I walk out, and I'm cool and collected. I get Amy on the phone now. She's hysterically yelling, crying, what's going on? Where's our son? In my head, I'm thinking, okay, I've got a shotgun. I've got a 22. I'm going to just follow the bus route. I'm going to find someone. It's going to be all over. I'm going to send him to be with Jesus. So then I tell the office, in five minutes, I'm calling the police. I start my timer. Four minutes later, the bus comes barreling up and five kids come off the bus who are still on the bus, my son being among them. I get in the car and I say, Jackson, I thought you were gone. I'm not mad at you, but I was terrified. And he said, Daddy, you don't get scared. And I said, well, I got scared today, buddy. And he broke down crying. And when we got home, we went up to my office chair and he sat on my lap. He said, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I knew that you'd always be there for me, and I just thought if a ninja took me, you would still come and save me. <laughs> I said, buddy, you're absolutely right. And that was one of those days where I got a glimpse, just a small glimpse, into how different my fathering is from God's fathering, because I was helpless. I couldn't do anything other than call and be frantic and worry. But God, the God that we have, is not that way. He is not a father who is out of control. He is not a father who can get caught off guard. He is not a father who, when the bus uh, keeps on driving because your son is reading books underneath the seat in the bus and misses his bus stop, he's not the God that worries and frets because he knows exactly where you are and where I am no matter what we're going through. If you missed last week, we started a new series on the Holy Spirit because God stopped me in my tracks. And today we're in Romans chapter 8. This is probably the best chapter in the Bible. If I had to pick one chapter or one page, if I were going to get marooned on a desert island, I would have this page on my person on a desert island to read and to memorize and to rejoice in because I truly believe that right now it's the best chapter. And as I said last week, we all have time, so read it this week, because we're only going to go through half of it this week. But as we get into it, I want us to pray, because God's Spirit is going to testify, is going to speak to the spirits that are here this morning. Father, 
I know the pressure of life that I have been under before. God, I know what it feels like to be full of shame. I know what it's like to be full of fear and anxiety and stress and to feel like the world is swallowing me alive. And I know that I'm not the only one in this room that has felt that. God, I also know the pain of religion when it's been abused to make people feel guilt and shame, to corral them to obedience with a rod instead of with love. I pray that this chapter, that these verses would help people understand what your spirit does in our lives. Send your spirit. Change our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Are you guys ready? This is my favorite uh, chapter, you guys. It's so good. And there's some big words I'm going to read through and we're going to come back to it. There is therefore now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, let's stop right there because I know you're thinking, man, that's a lot of condemnation, a lot of spirit. What is going on here? I want us to answer a simple question first. We're going to start here. There is, therefore, how much condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? None. No condemnation. Zero. It's not that God said, here's your spiritual report card, I'm going to look at it and grade you, and, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to take it and I'm going to erase it. That's not what God did. God looked at your spiritual report card, saw that you got all Fs, and he said, this is not going to work out. They are not going to graduate. So he took your report card, he threw it as far as he could to the east, and he took his love to the west, and he said, that's how far I'm separated from their sin and my goodness. But Jesus is going to come and fill that gap, and you get to have his report card. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I was a terrible student. Uh, Back when I was in high school, we didn't have uh, really, the internet wasn't a burgeoning thing yet. So when we needed to cheat on book reports, kids don't cheat, we went to the bookstore and we have these things, little yellow and black books called Cliff Notes, right? This is so cool. FYI, kids can go online and get these now for free for all the books. I'm so jealous because I had to save up money that I got from recycling cans just to to cheat on my homework. So I would go do that and I would I would do my cliff notes, and I'd try to get the best grades that I could, and I struggled. I was that kid that was ADD, like tapping all the time. I was sleeping, drooling, allergying, looking around, doing anything but going to school, but wanting to be in school, but focusing on the teacher. I would find any excuse, and it really panned out well for me because my senior year, my government teacher approaches me right before graduation and says, Tyrona, you sad sack. He called me a sad sack and a mugwump. I don't know why. You got to pull this together or you're not going to walk. I said, Mr. Astor, my mother wants me to graduate. He goes, I do too, but you're not going to make it unless you pull your act together. And man, I fretted over that grade. I studied more than I'd ever studied in my life. And this was for government. So it's not like my forte. I was bored to tears, but devouring everything I could about capitalism and economics and the judiciary branches. I was just learning. And I barely made it by the skin of my teeth. And I look back at that report card with such pride, and I remind myself and my kids all the time, Jackson, it's okay. D's get degrees. I'm really setting a high bar for my son. However, in spiritual life, it doesn't work that way. In spiritual life, God's standard is perfection on every single thing, and all of us fall short, and here's where it gets wrong so often. Here's where I I meet people, and they automatically come to me and I say, I'm a pastor, and a look of fear and a look of shame or a look of guilt comes across their face. Or when somebody's in front of me and they forget that I'm a pastor and we're playing golf and I hit my ball and it goes far and straight and 350 yards like it always does, and they hit theirs and it shanks off into the left and it was a $5 golf ball, and then they say what we call at the chapel road rage words, and then they go, oh, I'm so sorry, pastor. And I go, oh, Jesus died for that one already, buddy. Because we forget what this means when the Bible says there is no condemnation. 
none, none. When Jackson got in my lap after that bus ride, I didn't have to say, Jackson, what were you doing? I said, I thought you were gone and I was afraid. And he crawled up into my lap and said, I'm sorry. And we've gone through this enough time with my oldest where he, he's got this gaping hole of needing love. And he says, Daddy, do you still love me? Daddy, do you still love me? Daddy, do you still love me? Every time. So I've gotten in the mode of telling him lately, buddy, if you do every good thing in the world for the rest of your life, I'll love you. If you become the worst bad guy that's ever existed, I'll love you. And I know that if you're not a parent here, you're thinking, does that make sense? And I can't really tell you how it works. But for some reason, when that little kid comes out and looks half like you, but more like your wife, if you're being honest, you look at him and you say, there's just nothing. There's nothing that could separate my love for this kid. And I think God did that on purpose so that we come to verses like this. We read, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ because here's the picture that this is going to paint. God's looking down on you. By his spirit now, you are clothed in Jesus. So when God sees you, he sees Jesus. Now answer the question in your head. How happy do you think God the Father is with Jesus? On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm going to peg it about 10 million. Because he is thrilled with Jesus. Because Jesus did everything he ever wanted to please the Father. And now this spirit that it's talking about is the spirit that's going to be in you if you are in Christ. The spirit of the law sets you free. Of, of law sets you death. The, the spirit of life sets you free. Let's pick it up in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. Everyone say the word sarks. 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 That's a word for flesh, and it means the sin nature. Everyone who sets their mind on the things of the flesh, on the things of sin, is someone who's living in sin. Now, it is really easy to set our minds on the things of sin. If you have two ways to go, one is set your minds on the things of God, and the other is set your mind on the things of the flesh, man, one of these is a little bit easier than the other when you first start becoming a Christian. Now, let me tell you from personal um, and recent examples. Man, sometimes it is so much more easy to binge watch The Flash and the Arrow on Netflix than it is to read my Bible and throw myself into prayer. I may or may not have been tearing through seasons as I know God is saying, I'm right here. Because we have these. And I wish I had an app count. I wish I could see how many times I've touched an app over another one because I, I would hope that my Bible app opens up more than my Netflix app. I would hope that my prayer app opens up more than my Facebook app, although that may be unlikely. For you, what does it look like to set your mind on the things of the flesh or the spirit? This is a big battle, you guys. But here's, here's the thing. Some of us are thinking right now, well, okay, that's it. I'm going to set my mind on the things of God. Have you ever noticed how difficult it is to read your Bible? Has anyone ever noticed that before? Has anyone ever noticed that you can read Sports Illustrated, you can read People Magazine, you can read Us Weekly, you can read a book, and there's no distraction in the world? Like your kids are sleeping for the first time in 10 years, uh, there's no phone ringing, the AC is blowing, the birds are chirping. You can read all those books with no distractions, and then all of a sudden you put down Sports Illustrated, and you open up the Bible, and what happens? Verizon Fios is at your door. Your kid wakes up screaming. Your wife comes downstairs and gives you an assignment to do. It just blows up. And we think, oh, well, life calls got to go. And we think that it might just be a coincidence. I really don't think it's a coincidence. Every time we are coming to engage with our Father in heaven, spiritual warfare goes up. Every time we are saying, I'm not going to set my mind on the things of the flesh, the things of sin, the things about me, the things that I worry about and fear, I'm going to set my mind on God, that he is good, that he will provide, that I can be strong in him. As soon as you make that transition, arrows come flying in, arrows of distraction, arrows of fear. I never think about lists of things I need to buy until I go to pray. Never. I never do. I'm not thinking like, oh, I got to go to Costco and get this. I got, man, we're almost out of diapers. We got to go to the grocery store. And really the reality is, man, I hope Amy goes to the grocery store and gets diapers or whatever it is. I never do that until I'm like, okay, God, it's time to pray. So I do this thing now. I say, okay, God, I'm going to pray. And when I pray, I know that I'm going to get attacked with bombarding thoughts. So I do this. I say, God, I'm going to go to my river. And I visualize a river and boxes are floating down, wood crates. 
And I say, okay, God, I'm going to pray to you right now. Father. And then all of a sudden everything comes in. So I start taking that. Take that grocery list. I throw it in the crate. I let it go down the river and go over the waterfall. Kids, picking them up. Nope, going down the waterfall. Doing this. Waterfall. Errands, waterfall. Fears, waterfall. Worries, waterfall. And then finally I run out of stuff that is getting bombarded in my mind. And I say, ah, God, I'm finally here. One more thing, waterfall. Because to set your mind on the spirit is to enter into spiritual warfare. To set your mind on the flesh is to aim your life at death, these verses say. And this is how we can do this. When you set your mind on the things of the flesh, it's going to look like this. What can I do today to make myself look better? What can I do today to feel like I'm successful? What can I do today to feel loved? Now, those aren't all bad questions, but so often what turns out bad is when we ask those questions and we say, to feel loved, I'm going to try to get this person to approve of me by exaggerating that I did this good this job or by exaggerating that I did this for my parents. And that's not bad, but all of a sudden, that becomes a little demigod in in that person's life. Let me give you a classic example from Jackson since I'm totally abusing him today. Jackson comes home from school and they get graded on behavior like blue, green, purple, pink is the best. When he gets blue or green, he's like, he won't come home and say anything. He says, come home, hey, Dad, uh, blah, blah, blah. How was your day, buddy? Oh, great, great. Oh, got to go. Because he doesn't want me to know that he got blue or pink or blue or green. But when he comes home and he got pink, which is like the supreme, terrific kid, teacher writes a note, what's the first thing out of his mouth when he comes up to my office? Daddy, I got pink today. Do you love me? Just the same as yesterday, buddy. Now, he doesn't want to hear that because he wants to earn my love. He wants to have a sense of of earning it so that he knows that he has it. And we all do that with God. We all do that with others. We want to earn things because we feel like then if we are in control, then our life is in control. But the furthest thing, uh, that could not be further from the truth. The way to life is to set your mind on the spirit. So here's an example in futility I want you to try today. Next time you're out and about walking or scootering or biking or car riding and you see wind, I want you to try to follow the wind until it ends. So you'll see wind moving leaves and, and just do it for fun. If you're a jogger, like jog. I know everyone here jogs. I see tons of joggers. If you see wind going, say, I'm going to follow the wind until it goes no more. And you may run into a forest. You're going to get bitten by an armadillo or, you know, uh, k- killed with a boar or tusk, all the crazy th- I think deer around here. It's just nuts over here. But, but I want you to think about that. Because the spirit, the word for spirit is wind, we talked about last week. And if you're going to follow the spirit, if you're going to set your mind on the spirit, it's like setting your mind on the wind. We don't control the wind. We control our sin. We, we sin and we aim our sin to try to get all the things we think we want for our life. But the Bible says right here, set your mind on the things of the spirit. Set your mind on the wind and follow that where it goes. I love um, mazes always been fascinated with them. I used to buy graph paper and draw mazes, and I just found out that in Plant City, there's a cornfield maze. Um, Aside from sounding like a horror movie, I was very excited, but then I I saw the cornfield maze, and it was built for short people, so I was a little disappointed, so I'm like, my kids are all lost. They're going to get lost, have the time of their life. All the kids are going to get lost, have the time of their life, and I'm going to be there like, it's five feet tall. Like, there's the end. I love, I love the idea of the maze because you can go wrong ways and right ways and when you go a wrong way you hit a dead end you turn around such is life with the spirit of god and here's what i want you to do if you feel like your life is constantly plagued by sin and pain and death and stress i need you to step back and say i think i'm in a dead end in this game of of god i think that i've been following my flesh and i need to see where i'm doing that and where i'm not setting my mind on the things of the spirit and for some of you it's going to be abundantly clear Some of you are going to say, Ryan, I never set my mind on the things of the Spirit except for on Sundays. I do just a big old meal on Sundays, and then I starve from Monday to Saturday. And then I come and I do another big meal of God on Sundays, and I starve from Monday to Saturday. And then you're wondering why on Friday you're feeling so weak and famished, and why your self-control is going down, why your joy is going down, why your peace is going down until it's almost not existent. Because if you don't set your mind on the Spirit every single day, the 
wind keeps on going, and you're not going to catch that breeze until it comes around again. This is what he says in verse 9, and I need to hustle through because I want to get to my favorite part of this. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Paul's talking to the Roman church. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Last week, we talked about how the Holy Spirit dwells within us. This building is not the church. We are the church. I get on my kids all the time and my wife and my friends all the time, everywhere I've gone for the last five years. When they say, hey, let's go to church. Oh, we can't go to church. We are the church. When you guys are gone, this is no longer the church. This is just a building that's standing up with one broken AC unit. That's why you're all hot over here. I'm sorry. I tried to fix it. I only have a degree in theology. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, the power of the living God dwelling in you, here's what will happen next. And if he doesn't dwell in you, here's also what will happen. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Jesus. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. The Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm going to say it one more time to try to break through our church ears. The Spirit of God raised a guy who had been dead for three days from dead to life. And then that spirit says, I'm going to now live in you. So now when you pray, God, can you help me get out of the situation I'm in? The answer is redundantly, yes. I raised Jesus from the dead, and now I live in you. I was reminded this week, because Alice was posting on Facebook a couple times, and maybe other people were too. The most repeated phrase in the Bible is, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. And I think so many of us are trapped in fear. Some of us are just plain out afraid. We're afraid that life isn't going to go our way. We're afraid that our kids will never come back to God. We're afraid that our spouse doesn't love us. We're afraid that this disease is going to take us over. We live in fear. I don't think it was an accident that God made that the most repeated phrase in the Bible. God knows that sin will lead to fear. So he sent his spirit within us. He sent the biggest guy on the block to live in our hearts. Now, I know you can't tell from my way that I dress now, but I, I didn't always wear tucked in shirts and, and platy little Nordstrom shirts. I used to get in fights when I was younger. And man, I got the tar kicked out of me. And then I got bigger, and I still got the tar kicked out of me. And then I got enormous and angry. And then I had a friend who was crazy, and then nobody messed with us again. I think it was because of my crazy friend. He was that guy who had the reputation at school. And this was in high school. We were young punks. But he had that reputation of, like, I don't think this guy is safe. And he had been in enough altercations to where any time I knew I was going somewhere dangerous, I'd say, Ben, man, can you come with me? Yeah, man, I got you. I'm just twitching. <laughs> Strangest thing, I felt so safe with Ben. Because <laughs> we were friends from childhood. It just didn't, didn't bother me. But I knew he had my back. And that's just a little scrawny, well, now he's not scrawny. Back then, a little scrawny, crazy kid. How much more powerful is it that the God who created the universe dwells in you and me if you are in Christ? I mean, this is insanity. And in case you're wondering if I'm insane, I'm going to answer this question for you and let you know that I certifiably am. I will often be walking in prayer, and I'll ask God crazy things. Hey, God, if you want to, send a little lightning bolt right over there. And I'll wait like I think it's going to happen. Because I know that he can do it. Because I know that God will do insane things because he does whatever he wants. I remember when I was in debt early on in my Christian life, I had, a, I had became a Christian and I was going to college and someone said, hey, do you want a credit card today? It was my first credit card. I was 18 years old, dumb. And uh, I said, no, I don't want a credit card. And they said, well, you get a free Nerf football. In that case, sign me up. So I got my Nerf football that day and I got my credit card. It was my first credit card I ever had. And it was glorious. I mean, I was like, I could walk into Best Buy and they just give me stuff. And then all of a sudden, I'm a few thousand dollars in debt. 
And my like, God, no, why? And back then, that was a lot of money. Like, I worked at a church. I remember making uh, $9 an hour. And then one year, the uh, pastors called me into their office. And, uh, and they said, you know, we're, we've been thinking about you. We're so glad that you're here. Um, we wanted to give you a raise. I'm like, great, man, how much of a raise? And they said, 14 cents an hour. I'm like, great, man, churches are so loving. I'm going to buy an extra taco per month. Man, it was, it was fun, though. But when I, when, I got that, when I got that bill, my credit card, I said, God, how did I get into this mess? And I began praying, saying, God, I, I don't know what to do. I'm in a hole that I can't get out of. No joke, you guys. Somebody comes up to me and says, I don't know you. Uh, I mean, they knew of me because I was a youth pastor. You don't know me, but God told me to give you a check for this amount. And they handed me a check for exactly $1 more than all the debt that I had on my credit card. And they walked away, and I never saw them. That was it. And I'm like, God, why the extra dollar? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, said, I said, God, I, I need to, I can't believe that you would do this. I can't believe it. And I know what some of you are thinking. That's it. I'm going home. I'm praying. My debt be gone in Jesus' name. No, it doesn't work that way. Well, it did for me. I don't think it's going to work for you. I was so broken, I was so humbled, I was so lost in that what seemed like an insurmountable amount of money. And God was so gracious to come along and say, it's done. I'm your dad. This is done. I'm more powerful, Ryan, than you'll ever know. I know how many dollars are on your credit card. I know how many hairs are on your head. God knows right now who the most disobedient person in this room is. It's me or you. And God knows right now how many hairs are on every head in this room. And let's not be mistaken. We've already talked about this. That's a very powerful thing to know. Because right now there are a few of us who are squeezing hairs out. God knows right now every person that feels like they can't go on in their marriage, in their job, in their life. And he's saying to you, wait, Hold on, I'm here for you. Verse 12, so then brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Jesus bought us, so we don't owe sin anything. Jesus paid the price for sin, so now we are in debt to Christ. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So many times I hear Christians complaining about their sin. I just struggle with this sin. I struggle with this sin. I struggle with this sin. How do I get out of this sin? It's right here. By the Spirit, put the deeds of the body to death. By the Spirit, take your sin and put it to death. And you're saying, okay, Ryan, how do I do that? How do I say, Spirit of God, come into me and kill this thing? Just like that, but maybe louder and maybe with more tears, and with your face in the Bible, because you cannot overcome sin in your own power. You cannot overcome sin by simply trying harder. I've tried the hardest. I've tried harder than, than most people that I've met in my life because I can, I can turn on my type A, I can turn on my crazy, I can fast for weeks, I can pray every day, I can pound the wall and say, God, why? That's it, God, I promise. I'm gonna not do it anymore, and then two days later, I'm doing it. I can listen to 10 sermons a day and then fall back into my sin because I'm not relying on God's spirit. And here's what it looks like to rely on God's spirit. Because if you're in spiritual life, you're thinking that you've got to try really hard. You're thinking that life in Christ is about trying hard, climbing the ladder, doing things, and I'm just going to get there. God, I'm going to get out of this hole. I'm going to get out of this hole. And God says this, no, no, the way out of the hole is not climbing the ladder. The way out of the hole is faith. This is faith. When we sit in Jesus, we get to sit like this. Oh. And we get to breathe out. And God says, do you believe me? I say, yeah, I believe you, God. I believe you'll catch me. So we sit down. And then what we do is we get up and we do this. I'm going to go to church now, but I'm not going to trust God. I'm going to go to work on Monday morning, but I'm not going to rest on God. I'm going to look like I'm resting on God. How long could I do this for? I mean, maybe a little longer because my jeans are tight and they're acting like leverage but I'm not going to last very long. And so often, we're here with God, and, and God says, put 
your sin to death by the power of the Spirit. It doesn't mean get up and try harder. Here's what putting sin to death looks like. I'm addicted to this. I'm in love with this sin. I don't want to give it up. God, I need you to hold me up because I'm going to let my hands go of these sins and I feel like my world's going to crumble. God, be here for me when my world is falling apart. And you don't get out of the chair. You don't say, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go get rid of this. I'm going to go to this cloud. No, you stay in your chair and say, God, I'm giving it up. And it's literally going to hurt like hell. And you sit in the chair. And you say, here's my sin. But now that I'm sitting and I'm resting, I get to focus on the things of the Spirit. When you're sitting and resting on God, and when your sin is in front of you, and you're saying, God, take this from me, remove this from me, don't just end that. Set your eyes on the things of the Spirit. Open up the Word. Go to God in prayer. Put your junk in the river and let it float down until your mind is ready to focus on Him. Verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. There's that fear thing again. And I've got to get to this verse. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the Aramaic word for father. And, and I think that it's so beautiful. There's this scene. My, my wife asks me all the time why I have watched this scene. And I, I'll show her the scene from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Normally, think a funny show, right? But there's an episode where Will's dad comes back into his life. And Will didn't grow up with his dad in the Fresh Prince. He lived with his uncle in Beverly Hills, as the song goes. And his dad comes in, and he thinks he's going to reconcile with his dad. He buys his dad this statue of a father looking down, holding a son. And at the very end of the episode, when Will's supposed to go on this trip with his dad, Leroy, he comes back in, and Leroy says, Will, I, I got to go. I, I got to do something, and I'm going to come back for you, I promise. And then Will says, that's fine. Lou, or whatever his name was, Leroy Lou, sends Lou out. Uncle Phil comes in, the uncle. And Will Smith just blows the gasket. My dad wasn't there for my birthdays. My dad wasn't there when I learned to shave. My dad wasn't there for my first fight. I don't need my dad. I don't need him. I don't need, I'm going to find me a, a woman. I'm going to graduate from college. And then at the very end of this episode, probably the only sad ending episode of that, he looks at his Uncle Phil and says, why doesn't my dad love me? And they hug, and the camera pans away. I think, if we're being honest, some of us feel that way about God. We think that his love is conditional, that we're going to, push him away with our sin and we're going to sin so much that finally one day he'll say, I'm out of here. In Christ, you are adopted. You're brought into the family and we cry, Abba, Father. This week in this small group Bible study that we have uh, for a couple of our groups, we talk a little bit about this concept and I've challenged people to pray to God as their dad. Open up prayer saying, Dad, Daddy. And I'll tell you what, for some of you who have been Christians a long time, that will be the most uncomfortable phrase of the week. Because you want to start with Heavenly Father, Glorious Lord, and those are good things. But sometimes I think we need to remember that God is our Father, our Abba Father. Anyone uh, remember what a ba their baby's first words were? Their very first baby. Who has one kid in here? What was your, what was your kid's first word? Mama, mama, I love that. All the moms are like, yeah, mama. Babies can only say anything that doesn't require teeth, basically, right? So they're not going to say ta-ta, they're going to say mama, maybe papa, dada, ba 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 for 10 hours. I think this is where the Aramaic people got their word for dad for. The first thing out of baby's mouths are just these syllables. And if the Spirit of God is in you, here's what's going to happen. For the first time in your life, God will become your Abba. God will become the one who you can go to and say, dad, 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 dad. If you have not seen God that way, 
it may be a sign that you are not in God. Because when you receive the Spirit, you get this adoption. The Spirit will speak to your spirit, and you will be able to cry out, Abba, Father. There's probably nothing more precious in this world than being a parent. I take that back. Being a follower of Jesus is more precious. I tell my kids all the time that I would, uh, I love Jesus more than I love them. And you shouldn't giggle, because you should too. But I tell them the only way I can love them as much as I can is because of the way Jesus has loved me. Because at the end of the day, it's not just us sitting on a chair. It's the Spirit taking us to our dad who's in his chair. And he says, I love you. Man, you messed up today. I love you. Man, you really blew it yesterday. I love you. You got lost on the bus. You yelled at your spouse. You cussed at your kids. You road raged. You lied. You cheated. And here's what God says. I died for all of those things so that you can find rest right there. And some of you are thinking right now, that's it. I'm just going to go lie, cheat, cuss, steal my way because God's going to love me forever. This is the coolest part of it all. When I picked up Jackson off the bus, I didn't have to give him the discipline. I just told him where my heart was, and he melted. When you finally see God as your dad, and you finally realize the love that he has for you, one of two things will happen. Either you'll run and try to abuse it, thinking you can get away with it, in which case that might be a sign that the Spirit's not in you, or on the other hand, you, your heart will be melted and gripped and overcome by this love. And it can only happen when the Spirit of Christ, who raised Christ from the dead, comes into your life so that you can cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit will, will bear witness with your spirit. That's what verse 16 says. The Spirit of God will bear witness. And we'll close with this. Because all of you right now have this sense that you're standing in a courtroom before God. And you're saying, I need God to be my dad. How do I get that? And here's what that verse 16 says. In the courtroom, God is the judge. And he is there to judge all sin. And you stand before him, and you show him all your sin. And he says, guilty. But then he does something that no judge ever does or can do. He climbs out of the judge seat. He takes that from you and he turns around and says, I'm paying for this. And then he does something that no judge or lawyer or substitute can do. He goes over to the juror box and says, we're going to love this person because they are in us now. And God wraps you up in the whole process and he speaks to your spirit and he says, you are a child of God. He testifies for you even when you testify against yourself. Next week, we're going to look at how the Spirit groans in prayer. When you're praying, you don't have to say the Spirit does this for you. One thing that the Spirit does is this. When you put your head down and you say, I'm such a wretched sinner, the Spirit translates that to God and says, God, there's a heart ready for you right here. When you put your head on the floor and say, I've got to get out of this sinful mess that I'm in, the Spirit will translate that and say, God, here we go. This person's moldable. This person's ready to be yours. And then God's love will flood down into your life. Even when you don't believe good things about yourself, God will believe them about you because he has given you all that you need. Do you believe that today? We're going to pray. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to, to pray in your own mind and I don't want you to pray to the far off God I want you to pray to your dad so today ask your dad ask our dad to forgive you ask our dad to help set your mind on the things of the spirit ask our dad to help us see ourselves as he sees us in Jesus
that. You're the best dad I've ever known. You've been there for me when my life was crumbling. And you're here for those now in this room whose lives are crumbling. You're here for those whose fears are overwhelming them. I come asking as your kid, I'm begging you, Dad, break into the lives of these people. I pray that you would not be far off God to anyone here, that you would be Abba, Father. I pray that we would stop trying to earn our way to get into your love, but that we would rest and learn what it means to set our mind on the things of your spirit. I pray that you would get sin out of our lives by melting our hearts with your love. I pray that you would turn religion from a ladder to a cross so that we could finally rest and have the peace we long for. God, we never have to wonder if you love us. You're present in every breeze, in every breath. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.